I'm Andrew Jackson, Economic Geologist at Global Resource Investments. This second talk in the Ore Deposits 101 series focuses on layered complexes and kimberlites, and it'll be broken into two parts. Firstly, ore deposits associated with mafic layered in complexes, including copper nickel massive sulfides, chrome, <coughs> and platinum group elements, or PGEs. Secondly, diamonds associated with the kimberlite intrusions. Now you may remember that in the introduction to the Ore Deposits 101 talks, I pointed out that because of our limitations in current mining technology, all metals and minerals that we use are mined from the Earth's crust. We also noted that the average abundance of metals in the crust wasn't high enough for economic mining and that nature needed to provide a significant concentration of the metals and minerals in order to make grades which can be economically mined. I then described the process of partially melting rocks to concentrate metals into the melt portion and bringing that melt up through the crust to a shallower depth where it can be mined while cooling it to allow valueless minerals to crystallize out and be left behind and the remaining melt to be enriched in metals. I also mentioned that certain minerals that we do want sometimes crystallize or separate out early in this cooling process. These include chromium, platinum, copper, nickel and diamonds. And today I'm going to talk about these metals and minerals starting with the copper nickel sulfide deposits and then the platinum chromium deposits and ending up with diamonds. And for each of these I'll discuss how the deposits form some of the better known examples of each of these deposit types and how you explore for them. In the introductory talk I mentioned felsic, mafic and ultramafic rocks uh, but before I launch into talking about mafic layered complexes I should probably quickly review these descriptions for those who may not be exactly sure what they mean. Igneous rocks, those that are formed from molten magma are broadly classified according to their chemical composition using silica, potassium, sodium, calcium, iron and magnesium as the keen, uh, key indicators. Magmas rich in silica, sodium and potassium generally form pale colored quartz and feldspar when they crystallize and are termed uh, felsics. They are clustered on the left hand side of the slide. Magma that is poor in silica, but rich in iron magnesium, crystallizes dark colored minerals, such as pyrolivine and pyroxene. And the resulting rocks are termed ultramafic. These are on the right hand side of the slide. Magmas with a composition that is between these two end members are classified as intermediate or mafic, depending upon their specific composition. In general, a layman doesn't actually need to know the details of the chemical composition. He can broadly classify igneous rocks by the proportions of light and dark minerals. Felsic rocks like granite have few dark minerals. Intermediate rocks may have one-third dark minerals. Mafic rocks are two-thirds dark minerals. And ultramafic rocks are completely made up of dark minerals. In broad terms, Mafic and ma uh, ultramafic magmas crystallize at higher temperatures than felsic rocks and more fluid. The majority of copper nickel massive sulfide and chrome um, platinum group metal deposits <coughs> develop in large intrusions that are made up of layers of alternating mafic and ultramafic rock, hence the name mafic layered complexes. Being mafic, they were intruded at high temperatures and crystallize slowly, relatively deep in the crust. And that's probably enough of an introduction to the nomenclature of igneous rocks, so let's launch into the main deposit types associated with mafic uh, layered complexes, which are the copper nickel massive sulfides, uh, the platinum and chrome deposits. Mafic layered complexes are generally very large, pancake shaped intrusions that because of their high initial heat and deep burial tend to cool slowly. 
This allows them to develop the alternating layers of coarse-grained mafic and ultramafic rocks, pyroxenes, dunites, and gabbros. As you might expect, the rocks are generally black or dark green in color, although they may also develop layers of a feldspar that has high calcium content called anorthosite. And anorthosite, in contrast, is almost white in color. The vast majority of the world's nickel, platinum group elements, and chrome deposits are hosted in the mafic layered complexes, and these metals tend to crystallize out of the magma in pulses, which allows them to be concentrated in discrete layers at potentially mineable grades. The layered complexes are generally very large. They need to be to concentrate enough of the metals into an economic order body deposit. The monster of them all is the Bushveld complex in South Africa, which is 400 kilometers by 800 kilometers and has a volume of at least a million cubic kilometers. Although some of the big layered complexes host copper nickel uh, mineralization, most copper nickel massive sulfide deposits are in slightly smaller intrusions, which are well uh, less well layered. Sudbury at 20 by 45 kilometers is one of the biggest intrusions that hosts copper nickel deposits, and it's still well layered. But Voises Bay is only two and a half by one and a half kilometers in size, and it's virtually unlayered. I'll be start, start by talking about these copper nickel massive sulfide deposits. I should probably clarify that when a geologist talks about massive sulfides, he isn't referring to size, but to the fact that the sulfide crystals are in contact with one another rather than disseminated throughout the rock as isolated blebs. Massive sulfide in the photo. Copper nickel massive sulfide deposits form by starting, obviously, <coughs> with a magma that is rich in copper and nickel. High copper and nickel contents are not that unusual in mafic magmas. In fact, nickel is the fifth most common element in the earth. As the magma intrudes the host rock, it assimilates those host rocks and any sulfur that they may contain. And this is usually in the form of pyrite, which is uh, fool's gold or FES2. If the host rocks don't contain enough sulfur, these ore deposits cannot form. So the presence of a sulfur-rich host rock is actually more critical than having a copper-nickel-rich magma. The sulfur, nickel and copper combine in the magma to form an immiscible copper nickel sulfide melt that is heavier than the rest of the magma and it collects in pools at the bottom of the magma chamber like water droplets in oil. Platinum group metals are also sometimes concentrated in this immiscible melt. As the magma chamber continues to cool both the sulfides and the remaining magma crystallize. The main sulfide minerals are pentlandite which is an iron nickel sulfide, and chalcopyrite, which is a copper iron sulfide. 36% of global nickel production comes from sulfide deposits of this sort. The remaining 64% comes from nickel laterites, which consist of weathered mafic rocks, uh, with much of the nickel coming from the lat lat crystal lattices of oxidized silicate minerals like olivine. Because you need warm and wet conditions for lateritization, these usually form in tropical areas. And you can guess from their climates which of the producers in the pie chart rely on massive sulfides and which rely on laterites. In fact, the big three, Canada, Russia, and Australia, produce the majority of their nickel from copper nickel massive sulfide deposits. But whether sulfide or laterite style, the main source of the nickel is mafic intrusives. The vast majority of the nickel that is produced goes into the manufacture of stainless steel and variety, a variety of specialist alloys. These alloys are used by a wide spectrum of end user industries and the amount that goes into NICAD batteries is relatively small. Nickel use is dominated by stainless steel and specialist, uh, various specialist alloys, which account for 83% of the production. <clears throat> stainless steel and alloys are in turn used by a wide range of secondary industries, including engineering, transportation, electronics and building. 
I'll summarize the main features of three of the most significant copper nickel massive sulfide hosting intrusions Sudbury in Ontario, Norilsk in Russia, and Voises Bay in Labrador. This slide shows the geology of the Sudbury intrusive in northern Ontario. It may be unique in that it's thought to be the result of a massive meteorite impact that melted a large volume of the crust. <clears throat> this melted rock subsequently cooled and crystallized as a true layered complex. It's been suggested that the nickel in the complex may have come from the meteorite itself, but it really isn't necessary to call on this source, as the typical crust would contain enough nickel to account for the mineralization if it was sufficiently concentrated. There's also controversy over the meteorite impact theory, with opponents pointing out that it's developed on a pre-existing major crustal suture, which they consider to be an unlikely coincidence. And they also point out that all impact craters, even from glancing hits, are not circular, uh, are circular, not kidney-shaped like Sudbury. In defense of their hypothesis, however, the meteorite impact supporters provide evidence that lat later deformation may have flattened the Sudbury complex. The intrusion is, after all, two billion years old. And there's also a, uh, small structures called shatter cones, which are indicative of sudden impact shock. At present, the meteorite supporters seem to have the upper hand in this argument. The average composition of the entire intrusion is granodiuretic, i.e. felsic to intermediate, but the layers that host the copper nickel mineralization are mafic, as you would expect. Also, as you'd expect, the massive sulfides are developed on the floor of the bowl-shaped complex. So the mines, which are the little red dots on the plan, rim the complex. There's been active and large-scale mining at Sudbury since 1886, and it's still ongoing. At the moment, Sudbury produces about 10% of the world's nickel supply, and to date it has produced $320 billion worth of nickel. Moving on to Norilsk. Uh, Norilsk is situated in northern Russia, just 200 kilometers, 200 miles rather, from the Arctic Ocean. Geologically, this is a somewhat different beast from Sudbury. The mineralization is hosted by six separate intrusions that form feeders to the Siberian traps. The Siberian traps resulted from a huge outpouring of basaltic lavas about 250 million years ago. They covered 3.9 million square kilometers of Russia. The eruption has been blamed for triggering, triggering a series of events <clears throat> that led to the extinction, extinction of 95% of the Earth species at the end of the Permian period. Once again, the copper nickel sulfide mineral sulfides, massive sulfides, are concentrated in low points at the base of the intrusions. This is a section of drill core from Norilsk. The yellow material is chalcopyrite. The bronze colored material is pentlandite, a nickel sulfide. As at Sudbury, the Norilsk deposits are also contain PGEs. Norilsk consists of five underground mines which feed a central mill and smelter. These mines have been active since the Second World War uh, when they played a, a vital part in Russia's war effort. It's difficult to get up-to-date production figures, but in 19, uh, rather 2005, Norilsk produced uh, 243,000 tons of nickel, or 15% of the world's supply, half as much again as Sudbury. The third example of a, mass, a copper nickel massive sulfide that I'm going to talk about is Voises Bay in Labrador. This intrusion, which is the blue unit on the map, is tadpole shaped and 3 kilometers by 1 kilometer in size. <coughs> but again, uh, the massive copper nickel sulfides have puddled on the floor of the magma chamber. The deposit was discovered in 1993 by two prospectors who were working for an exploration junior called uh, Diamond Fields Resources. They were sampling for diamond indicator minerals, and they came across a gossen. A gossen's an outcrop of oxidized massive sulfides. Uh, Follow-up drilling in 1994 gave an intersection of 41 meters of nearly 3% nickel and 2% copper. 
and a second ore body was discovered nearby the following year. The deposit was acquired by INCO in 1996 and production began in 2005, slightly ahead of schedule. At present the concentrate is shipped from Voises Bay to the smelter in Sudbury, but a new smelter has been constructed on site and it's due to begin in uh, begin production in 2011. Nickel production at Voises Bay is expected to ramp up to 50,000 tons of nickel per year or 4% of world production. Current resources there are 2.2 million tons of nickel worth about 40 billion dollars at today's nickel price. Okay, let's move on to how you explore for these copper nickel massive sulfide deposits. We know that they are invariably hosted by large mafic intrusives and that these are often big enough to have developed layering. Most of these mafic intrusive bodies have a significant magnetite content which can all, uh, and so can be detected by geophysics even if they aren't readily defined by outcrop mapping. An airborne magnetic survey is the easiest way to map the limits of the intrusive if they don't outcrop. Uh, the red, magenta, red and orange area to the top in the top right figure is an example of how these intrusives in typically appear on a magnetic survey. You can see the, st the stingers in the tails of the aircraft where the magnetometer is housed during the survey. This avoids magnetic interference caused by the aircraft itself. Once you're in the right area, i.e. the, the mafic uh, intrusive itself, you can detect the massive sulfides in th one of three ways. By using soil or rock geochemistry and assaying directly for copper and nickel. Using electromagnetics or EM as it's commonly known. Uh, that's using a large electric loop to induce a magnetic field in the conductive material, which sulfide, massive sulfides are. And this induced magnetic field is then detected. So it's a two-stage uh, process. This can give some idea of where the conductor is, how deep it is, how, and how big it is. But it cannot tell you whether that conductor was caused by copper and nickel sulfides or by some other conductor such as valueless pyrite or graphite. You can use gravity surveys to look for anomalous, anomalously dense rocks such as massive sulfides. The figure in the bottom right shows Voises Bay uh, deposit as a green high density solid below the surface magnetic anomaly. Magnetic one is the uh, red tipped one uh, at the surface. But again gravity cannot determine whether the anomaly is caused by copper and nickel sulfides or something of minimal value. To test this you need to drill. The drill is always the ultimate exploration tool but because it's expensive cheaper geophysical or geochemical exploration methods are generally used first to optimize the sighting of the drill holes. The other major group of deposits in the mafic layered complex complexes are platinum group elements and chrome deposits. But unlike copper nickel massive sulfides they don't form as puddles on the floor of the intrusions they form in discrete layers well up in the magma chamber. The PGEs, that's platinum, palladium, rhodium with lesser amounts of osmium, ruthenium and iridium are often but not always spa spatially related with chromium in the form of chromite. Chromite is an oxide of chromium and you can see discrete black chromite beds uh, between the pale grey and anorthosite in this outcrop in the Bushveld complex looks almost like a sediment. An example of this co-deposition of PGEs and chromite is the so-called UG2 reef uh, in the Bushveld complex. The UG2 reef is the dark material at the top of this photo uh, which was taken in a stope in the Bushveld complex, one of the mines there. But P PGEs may also be unassociated with chromite and instead be associated with minor amounts of copper and nickel sulfides as in the Marensky Reef also in the Bushveld complex. This is drill core from the Marensky 
and you can see that there's in fact very little black chromite. There's white felspars and dark green pyroxenes and uh, olivines, but very little of the black chromite. The crystallization from the magma of both PGEs and, and chromite is triggered by certain chemical uh, and temperature conditions. This crystallization process is defined by phase chemistry and is complex. The process is illustrated by simplified phase diagrams like the figure on the uh, top right hand corner of the slide, uh, but I won't go into it in detail in this talk. The bottom line is that relatively small changes in temperature and chemistry of the differentiating magma can lead to major and sudden changes in the composition of the crystallizing minerals. Mafic magmas tend to be hotter and more fluid than felsic magmas, and as the minerals crystallize, they fall to the bottom of the melt and accumulate there, often being winnowed or sorted and eroded by currents in the magma chamber. <clears throat> you can see in the same out picture how some of the chromite layers in that outcrop appear to split or even cut out as a result of these, cu um, these currents. At first glance, the rock looks more like a sediment than an igneous intrusion. Platinum's main usage is in the auto industry, where it's a critical material in catalytic converters and certain spark plugs. But it's also used as catalysts in numerous other uh, applications. Its use in jewellery is gro growing, because platinum metal, although it looks like silver, it, doesn't, it does not corrode or tarnish and it's significantly harder than either silver or gold. Palladium's principal use is also in catalytic converters, although it is less effective than platinum. Chrome is mainly used in hardening steel alloys and anti-corrosion plating of steel, but it's also used in yellow and orange paint pigments. Now let's take a look at some examples of PG in chrome deposits, starting with the bushveld. As I mentioned earlier, the bushveld complex is the granddaddy of the mafic layered complexes, and, it's cover, and it covers an area equivalent to the size of the state of Utah. In the map in this slide, the intrusion is colored red and green. It has three main lobes, and individual layers can be traced horizontally over a distance of 400 kilometers, as you can see in the various vertical sections in the figure at the bottom right. Those are stratigraphic sections spread out across the basin. The platinum and chrome deposits are in the lower part of the lobes, which is the uh, green areas on the map. So mineralization outcrops around the rim and dips shallowly towards the center of the intrusion, rather like in uh, the Sudbury intrusion. Although the bushveld has a maximum vertical extent of around 10,000 meters, or 10 kilometers, the Marensky Reef is just 30 to 90 centimeters thick, and the UG2 Reef is generally less than 50 centimeters. In other words, the economic PGEs have been concentrated into one ten thousandth, thousandth of the volume of the intrusion. This is a stunning example of nature's free upgrading from the average crustal abundance. Platinum to palladium ratios for the Marensky and UG2 vary between 2 to 1 and 12 to 1. In other words, the deposits are very high in platinum. In spite of the narrowness of the mineralizing, mineralized layers, they're very continuous, which assists in mining. And the bushveld accounts for 80% of the world's PGE resources and 60% of its annual production. There are several chromite layers at various levels in the bushveld, but even so, uh, but but even so, even the chromite has been concentrated into one uh, less than a thousandth of the total volume of the intrusion. This is a photo of some core from a drill hole through the critical zone of the of the bushveld, the portion of the stratigraphy that hosts all the PGE mineralization. The Marensky Reef is well developed here and it comprises the lower part of the dark material in the center of the photo. 
The thicker the normal UG2 underlies the Marinsky and makes up the dark section towards the bottom of the picture in the last tray, the lowermost tray. The two reefs are almost invisible in the photo of a test pit at the top left. The still water layered complex is in Montana and although it's way smaller than the bush felt, it is still 25 kilometers long. <clears throat> However, because it's been tipped up on edge, it's only two to six kilometers wide. The majority of the intrusive is composed of ultramafic rather than mafic rocks, i.e. peroxinites and dunites rather than gabbros. But as in the bush felt, the chromite and PGEs are concentrated in discrete horizons. The stillwater deposits are platinum poor and palladium rich, with nearly four times as much palladium as platinum. So although the overall grade of the ore is, is uh, about 10 grams per ton per combined PGEs, which is similar to the bush felt, the value of the ore per ton is less than half that of the bush felt because of the low, relatively lower price of palladium. For this reason and the fact that the stillwater complex tends to dip more steeply than the bush felt and mining is more expensive, stillwater ore deposits have only marginal economics. Chrome, copper and nickel were produced from stillwater during the Second World War but production of PGEs only began in 1985. In 2005, Stillwater produced 13% of the world's production of PGEs, but much of this was obviously as palladium rather than as platinum. The last example of the PGE and chromium intrusion that I'll mention is the Great Dyke in Zimbabwe. The Great Dyke is a layered complex with a strike length of 500 kilometers and a width of between 3 to 12 kilometers. It is visible as a dark line parallel to the arrow on the satellite photo in the top right hand picture of the slide. Unlike the Stillwater complex, this long narrow outcrop pattern is its original shape and not due to til tilting on edge. Chrome has been produced from the Great Dyke since the 1920s Although PGEs were also discovered in the 1920s, earlier production attempts were not successful due to the lower grades than in the bushveld and difficult mining and metallurgical conditions. Uh, worthwhile production in Zimbabwe only began in 1994 and the country now produces about 7% of the world's platinum, mainly through Impala Platinum. And Impala Platinum's outlook is for increasing proportions of its uh, platinum production to come from uh, the, the Great Dyke deposits as opposed to the Bushveld. So those are some examples of the big PGE chromium deposits. How do uh, expiration methods for these deposits differ from those for the copper nickel massive sulphide deposits? Well, since both are found in large mafic intrusive complexes, the initial stages are similar and airborne magnetics can help define the outlines and some of the internal structure of the intrusive bodies. And you can see how the Lac des Isles intrusive complex in Canada shows up clearly as red and magenta in the top right hand image. But unlike massive sulphides and cro uh, sulphides, chromites and PGEs don't have significantly different geophysical con uh, characteristics from unmineralized rocks. So most geophysics won't help much in locating the actual mineralization within the intrusives. Once the critical horizon is identified by mapping, then seismic surveys may possibly detect the change in the host rocks, but otherwise we're going to be limited to geochemistry, including soil sampling, trenching and rock sampling, if the deposits are near surface, or drilling for cri the critical uh, horizons if they're a lot deeper than that. Okay, so what are the takeaway points on copper, nickel, pl platinum and chrome deposits in mafic layered complexes. Firstly, copper, nickel, sulfide, massive sulfides, PGEs and chrome deposits are usually associated with large mafic intrusives. Many of these are layered. The general rule is the bigger the intrusion, the better. You need the large intrusions to provide enough uh, metal content to be concentrated into a worthwhile deposit. 
copper nickel massive sulphide dumps accumulators puddles on the floor of the intrusion whereas PGEs and chromite form as thin but laterally continuous layers in the body of the layered intrusions. <coughs> Exploration for copper nickel massive sulphides relay, relies mainly on mapping and airborne magnetic surveys to identify the host intrusions and then electromagnetics or EM and gravity to target uh, drill. Exploration for PGEs and chrome depends on the same initial magnetic survey as for copper nickel and exploration but then with follow-up of map, uh, mapping and geochemistry to guide the drilling and the main PGE producers <coughs> are South Africa Russia Canada Zimbabwe and the United States in part two of this talk I'll cover diamonds and their kimberlitic host rocks. Diamonds consist of crystalline carbon. Although a significant proportion of diamonds are derived from placer deposits, i.e. hosted in sediments, placers are secondary deposits, and all diamonds were at one time or another hosted by kimberlite igneous rocks. The name kimberlite comes from the town of Kimberley, which grew up around the prolific diamond mines in northern uh, South Africa. This is where Cecil Rhodes established the De Beers Consolidated Mines in 1888, named after the local farmer whose land the discovery was made on. And you can see one of the old abandoned pits in the picture at the bottom right. The upper portion of the pit was dug by hand in the 1880s. That's the, uh, where the photo in the top right uh, was uh, taken. Kimberlites most commonly form pipe-shaped intrusives, often fairly uh, small in, in diameter, but they may also form dikes or even beds of volcanic plastics surrounding the intruded pipes. Kimberlite is basically a form of peridotite, in other words composed dominantly of olivine, phlogopite mica magnetite, a particular type of chrome-rich garnet, and you'll see why this is important when we come to talk about uh, diamond exploration. Fresh kimberlite is hard and a dark blue-green color and as it oxidizes it becomes much softer and changes to a yellow-brown. The change from oxidized to fresh kimberlite occurs at the break of slope in the, pit, in the photo of the old pit in the bottom right. Now I emphasize in that first introductory talk how all the materials we mine are derived from the crust and that's fundamentally correct. However, although diamonds are mined from the crust, they have their origins in the mantle, more than 100 kilometers below the base of the crust. Most of the kimberlite melt is derived from even deeper in the mantle, and the diamonds are picked up by the melt on its way to the surface. And that's why I have included kimberlites early in this series of talks, rather than lumping them with the shallow epithermal processes. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, and although the kimberlites were entreated between 2 billion uh, years ago and the present, some diamonds started crystallizing out more than 3 billion years ago, just 25% into the life of the Earth. <clears throat> they then floated around for millions of years in the plas plastic crystal mush, waiting for their ride up to the surface. Diamonds only form under continental plates, with the correct temperature and pressure conditions exist, not under any oceanic plates. And because they formed early in the Earth's history, they're generally only under old Archean crust, a critical point when we come to diamond exploration. Kimberlites must be in place fast in order to avoid the diamonds being resorbed or, or remelted as the pressure drops. As kimberlites rise, <clears throat> they degas large amounts of high pressure carbon dioxide. When they get close to the surface, that gas expands and they, and they mix with groundwater to develop a fluidized, almost foamy consistency that causes them to complete their journey to the surface with explosive force. There the kimber kimberlite erupts violently but briefly, forming a crater and blowing fragments of kimberlite into the air. 
and that the crater is often partially filled with a mixture of ejected kimberlite fragments and wall rock that falls back to surface. As I mentioned earlier, although there are kimberlites in a variety of geological terrains, diamondiferous pipes are almost always in or above Archean cratons, and those are the orange areas on the map. And only a few of those kimberlite pipes that are on the Archean crust actually contain diamonds. And even fewer of those diamondiferous pipes contain enough diamonds to make economically viable. In fact, only about 1% of kimberlite pipes host economic diamonds. Something like 80% of the world uh, diamond production comes either from sub-Saharan Africa or Russia. <clears throat> In Africa, the big producers are Botswana, South Africa, Congo DRC, Angola, and Namibia. Zimbabwe's production has ballooned in the last uh, two or three years with the discovery of the Marangi deposit. But since this was discovered by Mugabe and his, uh, confiscated by Mugabe and his inner circle, uh, no production figures are available. Diamond grades of economic kimberlites vary hugely. The premier deposit in South Africa has a phenomenal grade of almost 34,000 carats per hundred uh, tons of ore. In Arapa, Botswana, uh, in Arapa, uh, in Botswana, it has a grade of about 120 carats per hundred tons. Chuaneng, also in Botswana, 44 carats per hundred tons. And Letseng, in Lesotho, a mere 2 carats per hundred tons. So you might ask, how does Letseng survive economically with a pitiful grade of only one fifteen thousandth of Premier's grade? The answer lies in the stone size and quality. Letseng hosts some of the biggest diamonds ever discovered. The photo shows an ex exact replicas of two of these mammoth stones. In diamonds, the size and the quality of the stones is more important than the overall grade in terms of carats per hundred tons. This is an exception to the grade is king saying that you so often hear among uh, miners. So how do we set about exploring for diamonds? We start with the knowledge that diamondiferous kimberlites exist only above Archean cratons <coughs> and that, that they tend to form clusters within broad linear trends. The main exploration tools are geophysical surveys. Kimberlites contain magnetite and have a relatively high specific gravity. So either magnetic or gravity surveys can be used. So long as the rocks into which the kimberlites have been emplaced have low gravity or magnetic characteristics. The picture in this slide, in the top right, is a satellite image of the featureless Kalahari Desert in the southern Botswana. The roughly circular features are shallow salt pans unrelated to kimberlites. <clears throat> the bedrock and kimberlites are masked by tens of meters of windblown sand. But when you put a magnetic image over the same area, you can clearly see the kimberlite pipes hidden below that sand cover. Ground prospecting relies on what's called KIMS or kimberlite indicator minerals. You'll remember I mentioned the uh, chromite rich garnets that are often found in kimberlites. These are almost unique to kimberlites. Other accessory minerals include chromite, ilmenite, clinopyroxenes and obviously olivines. All of these have higher densities than, say, quartz or felspar, and they're classified as kimberlite indicator minerals. Kimberlite uh, kim sampling involves taking wide space soil or stream sediment samples, separating out the heavy minerals, and examining them under a binocular microscope to look for the presence of kims. If kimberlite is found in outcrop, taking a small bulk sample at surface may be possible. Assaying the sample and plotting the calcium against chromium content on a graph like this allows you to differentiate potentially diamondiferous kimberlites, left of the red line, from barren kimberlites to the right of the red line. However, as with most deposits, confirmation of these indirect uh, exploration methods require drilling and testing for diamonds. 
Diamond exploration is one of the riskiest exploration ventures. The odds are strongly stacked against success. However, with good science and exploration techniques, that level of risk can be considerably reduced. And the rewards, when successful, are enormous. <clears throat> Just look at the sale prices for some of these high quality stones. Uh, bottom left, sec 4.6 million. Center, 10.4 million dollars. Uh, 12.36 million. All for individual stones. Very, very profitable. So what are the learning points on uh, diamonds and kimberlites? <clears throat> Firstly, all diamonds originate in kimberlite pipes or dikes, including those in placer deposits. Kimberlite is an ultramafic rock derived from the mantle. Diamonds crystallize in the mantle, well below the crust, but they're carried up into the crust by the rising kimberlitic mag magma. Only 1% of kimberlites are economic, and these are almost always found in or above Archean cratons. Sub-Saharan Africa and Russia together produce 80% of the world's diamonds. Diamond exploration uh, relies heavily on magnetic and gravity surveys and sampling for kimberlite indicator minerals or kims. And the value of a deposit is more dependent on the quality of the stones than on the grade in terms of carats per 100 tons. So that's the end of this talk. Talk in the ore deposits one and one series, we'll discuss porphyries and IOCGs or iron oxide copper gold deposits.